Thank you for listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Sign up to our Patreon to receive bonus content, live streams and our weekly newsletter with money off books and museum visits as well. Plus early access to all live show tickets. That's patreon.com slash we have ways. Alarm! Alarm! Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray, and James Holland, your Second World War podcast of choice. Um, James, how are you? Uh, well, I'm all right. I'm still suffering from man flu a bit, which is why I'm back home and not in Cornwall. Yeah, you're back I've in the Holland been, bunker, I see. I'm back in the Holland bunker, yeah. I, got, I, got, I woke up yesterday morning and I just felt absolutely dreadful. They've been sort of coming on me all week. And I felt really sorry for myself. And I thought, do you know what? I just don't want to be here anymore. No, fair. So uh, I got in the car, drove home, sort of sniffing and snuffling and feeling, feeling a little bit sad. Um, uh, and 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 got home. So here I am. I had a good night's sleep. Took night nurse. Night nurse that knocks you out. It's absolutely amazing. That stuff. It's the like, stuff. Night nurse. It's the stuff. It's the, I mean, it's the, if night nurse wanted to sponsor this podcast, anyway. Um. Uh, yeah. We- <laughs> All right, so, 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 I'm, so I'm so I'm working out. I'm feeling a little tiny, little bit more human, but not much. But I'm um, I'm back in broad chalk. Great. Well, before we before we get into what we wanted to talk about, um, don't forget, ladies well, and gentlemen. How are you? More to the point, you know, uh, selfishly I'm, going on about me and my man flu. I'm I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I had a great <laughs> weekend. Popped into Duxford yesterday. Saw yes. the Bris- saw the Bristol Blenheim go by. More elegant um, than one would imagine. Yeah, more elegant than one might what might imagine. But nevertheless, but faster. Well, yes. I mean, it. You know, I don't know that he had the. I don't know that he had all the throttles on. But I, hmm. I, it, it looked what it looked like. So many of those aircraft from nineteen thirty nine, nineteen forty. It looked like sort of hot, the last gasp of those sort of slightly clunky planes. Yes, it's done in sort of brown and green, isn't it? So yeah, it's yeah. kind of nineteen forties pattern rather than nineteen forty one. Yeah, exactly. But before we go any, and then I, and I popped into the Air Assault Museum, and I've had a good chat with them actually. I wanted to touch on that. Well, but right. anyway, we have Ways Festival. Right, everybody yep. who's listening, um, we don't do much hard sell on this podcast, but we are going to sell hardly hard any on at this. all. Hardly, hardly any, any, at all. hardly any at all. So we have Waste Festival um, for 2024. The tickets are on sale now, um, and we have a date for you, um, which we kept. We, we kept back because we, we there is a hierarchy here. Our patrons, well, they didn't know about it first. We knew about it first, and then our patrons, obviously, after that, the 19th to the 21st of July, 2024, at Black Pit Brewery. Um, uh, which is um, near, right next door to Silverstone. You can see Silverstone from it at the top of the hill. Yep. Um, tickets for our Patreons, independent company, um, are on sale now. And we're offering early bird tickets at a reduced price. There's only 500 of those on offer. And they're they're going quite quickly, I think. There's also a VIP ticket. Um, uh, so if you come to uh, uh, stay, you want to stay at the Hilton Garden in Silverstone, you get, you get a discount on that there's a welcome reception on the thursday evening with me and jim um so you get to you get to hang out with the cool people there's exclusive yeah. merchandise there's skip drink the calvados. queue entry skip yes drink calvados just skip the queue entry to the festival and there'll be a wristband speedy for you boarding. so for your thursday exactly speedy boarding and 15 percent off their discount code at the hilton um gardening in silverston so we've Got the thing up and running. Normally, we don't we don't get tickets on sale quite as promptly as this, but we thought that this year we wanted to crack on with things. Just get organised. Uh, just just get organised. So program um, coming along. Yeah, there's a, a program coming along. It'll be if you came last time. It'll be more more of the same, but more is the important more of the same, but more. That's yeah. definitely the the line yeah. for yeah. we have ways fest. So we'll see you there hopefully. So that's the nineteenth. To the twenty first of uh, July. Um, yeah, uh, so we've brought it a little bit forward from September. So we've done. What have we done? We've done September, July, September, July, haven't yeah, we? So we're and, back um, on July. I, yeah. I suspect it'll stick with July now. Well, we're avoiding. Which we're, we're trying to avoid basically anything else. Anything else? That's the that's the issue. Is there's a there's a lot for people to do. There's a lot on, and this is just before the schools the. Uh, state schools break up as well. It's the weekend hmm. before that, so so, so don't give us any of your kind of I'm going on a holiday yeah, excuses. You shouldn't tread on your holidays, lying. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's and there's pretty good there's pretty good deals for kids, isn't there? Yeah, there's pretty good deals for kids. Under 16s are free, um, and it's we have ways the best fest. deal. That's the best yeah, deal. It's very very strong. We have waysfest.co.uk. Um, and and we are assembling we are assembling uh, quite the bill. But 
What, Jim, you sent me this amazing uh, set of notes to talk about today, which then spun me off into a... Um, <laughs> a rabbit hole of rabbit Sunday hole night fun. Of, yeah. Um, and it's the 13th. We're recording this on the 13th of November. And on the 13th of November, 1941, Ark Royal, part of Force H, mm-hmm. was uh, sailing westerly, steering westerly, returning to Gibraltar in adverse weather conditions. Um, uh, Force H had been sighted by U-205, who were 0406, had fired three torpedoes aimed at Art Royal. All the torpedoes missed. Well, there we go. That's all right, then. then yeah, uh, um, except. Uh, 0645, Art Royal flew off six swordfish to go look for the um, – t- uh, do an anti-submarine search. Then, <laughs> this is the problem, in the afternoon – and what I think is really interesting about these is these things go on all day, don't they, these yeah. chases and hunts, mm-hmm. and the sort of incremental – Sides like chipping away at each other, stalking each other. Yep. Uh, at 1540, the hydrophone on the Legion detected an unidentified sound assumed to be propeller noise of a nearby destroyer. Yes, because you, you can switch over from uh, from normal Aztec to, to listening on the hydrophones. Yeah. But actually, it was U-81's torpedoes. So at 1541, so one minute before, they hear the torpedo propellers, but they assume it's a destroyer or HMS Legion do, in recorded position 36, um, uh, 3 north, 445 west, just as a sword, one of the, as a swordfish landed, one of U-81's torpedoes hit Art Royal on a starboard side abreast the bridge, causing a great spout of water to shoot up in the aircraft on the deck to jump. Mm. I mean, b- bloody hell. <laughs> Captain yeah. Bourne was on the flight deck when the torpedo struck, and he raced the bridge to take command, but communications within the strip were immediately lost, and Art Royal continued moving ahead and started to list to starboard. The only crew member lost was Abel Seaman E. Mitchell, who was the oldest rating on board, and was on duty on the lower steering position when the torpedo struck. He was believed killed in the explosion. Wow. But everyone else got, got away. Everyone so else it got away. it wasn't a quick sinking. It was a slow... No. So then they... Slow burner. Then the idea is to, is to tow Art Royal to Gibraltar, and she's lost um, uh, the, the following morning, 0624, Art Royal's bow wow. had disappeared below the surface of the Mediterranean. So they do what they can to try and keep her going. They just, but they just can't can't keep her to a Gibraltar. Yeah. yeah. It's probably a million miles from where Eagle went down. No, I don't think so. I mean, that's losing an aircraft yeah. carrier. That, when you've got all your destroyer escort. And the reason I got into this is because you want, you want to talk about life on Royal Navy destroyers. And, uh, this well, yeah, because uh, yeah, I mean, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up this novel and one of the characters yeah. ends up on a, on a tribal class. I've always rather liked the tribals, kind of more so than the hunts, because I like the fact that they're kind of bigger and faster and more guns on them. Yeah. I always kind of think kind of torpedo, sure, morpedo, really. But when you're talking about destroyers, you, you want them to be, you know, you want them to be bristling with gunnery, don't you? Yeah. You know, and, and so they are, <laughs> you know, they've got the sort of four twin mounted 4.7 inch guns, you know, it's 120 millimeter, you know, they're pretty, pretty yeah. serious stuff. So I've been looking at kind of trying to work out kind of, you know, what my guy's experience would be on the, you know, as a sub lieutenant um, in the yeah. RMVR, you know, what what his experience would be and, and how to welcome him in, welcome him into a, into a team on a on a destroyer. And, you know, destroyers are they're kind of more fun than, than frigates and corvettes, which are a lot smaller. Well, look, right, I think we don't do Navy very often, do we? No. So I think the thing we're going to have to do. Is not right, do all of them, are we? Well, no, is what's a frigate? Yes, all right. What's a destroyer? What's a corvette? Well, I was thinking what we could do is we could go through kind of, you know, the experiences on each of these classes. Brilliant. Let's do that then. At various because, times, but let's do destroyers yeah, today. Because I just sort of think these kind of ship names, they do get they, a bandied about is too strong, but but they get they get used a lot. But, you know, what's the difference? So a destroyer, a destroyer is for really, it's for escorting capital ships or hunting down U-boats. And escorting capital ships, Probably involves hunting down U boats, doesn't it? It's the so that so those things are those things are overlapped, aren't they? But also providing fire support, particularly in a kind of you know, uh, you know, if you're doing an amphibious assault or something, or, yeah, you know, you're protecting Tobruk during the siege or something, and the convoys yeah. come in, you would protect protect that convoys is coming in and all that kind of stuff. So they've got a they've they have got a sort of multitude of different roles. Corvettes and 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 frigates are smaller than destroyers. They're kind of you know kind of eighty meters long, something like that. And they are specifically escorts. You know, they are just escorts of merchant vessels, and they are equipped with lots of torpedoes and depth charges and that kind of stuff. Well, ma- mainly depth charges, yeah. um, and um, and and a little bit of gunnery, but 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 mainly they're they're anti submarine things. That's what they do. Yeah. And then above the destroyer, you then got a light cruiser. 
which is a fairly fast but but um, under armoured, uh, but bigger. Then you've got a, a battle cruiser or heavy cruiser, which yeah. is you know like HMS Hood or something like that, um, which is you know for the most part pretty well protected. Um, lots of guns. And then you've got a battleship, which is bigger. And then you've got yep. the aircraft carriers. So the big capital ships are the cruisers, battleships, um, aircraft carriers. And the destroyers are the kind of sort of, you know, they're, they're the kind of sort of multiple roles and nimble and fast. Well, they depend. I mean, they can go from kind of sort of 25 knots to 36 knots, that kind of speed, you know. But 36 knots is as fast as anything you've got, really. So the tribal class you mentioned earlier is capable of 36 knots, isn't it? Which is which Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. They're serious. Fast. What, what Britain's got at the beginning of the wars, they've got a whole load of of different destroyers because they got ones that were kind of developed in the First World War. There's a whole yeah. new, you know, the V&W class, for example, which is developed from 1916 onwards, pretty heavily armed. Yeah. You'd have at least sort of four or five four-inch guns. You've got all those sort of interwar destroyers. They're sort of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H class. There's something quite funny about the about <laughs> that there's, there is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H, and then there's... O P Q R S T U V W. Yeah, they do go on. They do go on. It's quite, it's quite funny. How the, and the, the, rest assured, though, there is J K and N and yeah. L and M. So, so, so we can only have twenty six types of destroyer because <laughs> after that we've run out. But the ones that the ones that get developed a bit more heavily tend to have a proper name, like the Hunt class, for example. Yeah. So the Hunt class is is, is probably the biggest wartime destroyer and they're a bit smaller more on torpedoes and depth charges and less on gunnery yeah and they're probably kind of you know they really are kind of um escort destroyers and, and anti mm. anti-submarine vessels rather than the fire support role that the tribals have yeah uh they're a little bit slower like 27 and a half knots something like that then you've got those that you've got those um town class destroyers, which are those sort of useless hundred and twenty American ones that sort of first yeah. first world war era sort of you know total sm- smokestacks and all the rest. Yes. The problem with having smokestacks is you can see them forever, yeah, you yeah. know, because they just you know the funnel chucks out kind of all sorts of filth. They're the destroyers that Churchill sort of essentially begs for, aren't they? Yes, yes, but it's it, but but it's less for the destroyers and more for the kind of getting American no, buy-in. involvement. It's that they're, they're symbolic. Most of them end up being gooseberries opposite the beaches in yeah. Omaha. Yeah, yes, exactly. They get, but essentially get scrapped. So, yeah, they have a role. But, but it's interesting, though, isn't it? The, the idea is that they're symbolic of America's involvement and you can see them a mile off. It's almost like if you were writing this, you'd go, that's a bit on the nose, isn't it? Yeah, 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 absolutely. But my guy, my guy, um, he, he's on a tribal class and he's on HMS Iceni. Right, and they're all named after tribes. And what I've noticed is that they're not named after ancient Celtic tribes. They're, but one of the tribes is Cossack, which is quite interesting. Yeah, they're they're um, Afridi, Ashanti, Bedouin, Cossack, Eskimo, Gurkha, Maori, Mashona, Matabili, Mohawk, Nubian, Punjabi, Sikh, Somali, Tatar, and Zulu. You'd you'd never get away with it. Ones. You'd, you'd never get away with it these days. The no, you certainly wouldn't. <laughs> but anyway, my 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 fictional one's called Iceni, but it's been really really funny. There's an amazing book. I sent you a couple of pictures from it, where are all the blueprints of HMS Cossack. Yeah. So you can see this this tribal class destroyer absolutely dissected in in minute detail. Of yeah, where, it's extraordinary. You know, how the rooms laid out, where the bridge works, you know how everything works. It's quite interesting because when you when I was I was looking back over um the Good Shepherd, you know the Sears Forrester book that we so yes. enjoyed, yes. Uh, which then was the one that Tom Hanks made into Greyhound. Yeah. And um, he talks about going onto the bridge and the kind of pilot house behind it, but 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 you you don't have that on the tribal class. You have the bridge bridge on the top then you have the, the gun um you know the director tower yeah. um behind it which is a sort of circular thing which can swivel and then below the bridge you've got the signals room and the Aztec yeah. and, and 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 all the rest of it so it's, it is a door and the captain's cabin so it's a different construction and what you'd have yeah. had with the bridge is the bridge is always open which makes it really rough you think well why would it be open that seems crazy the main reason is so you can see better you can just see better when you when you're in the elements you know because if you put glass around it, you just get covered in spray. We all know what kind of you know looks like sort of salty seed when it when it, yeah. it it sticks and blurs and you can't see diddly squat after a while. So you would add a sort of glass shield in front of you, but your head would be above that. This is the thing though, because in Greyhound, he has he has windscreen wipers, doesn't he? Maybe that's because they're just American and they've got more modern stuff. I don't know, but they have uh, they have open bridges on everything. I mean, or you know, it's easier to film. Maybe. Maybe it's easier to film than the chucking butts buckets of water over Tom Hanks. Every but five on, you know, on heavy cruisers on a battleship, you also have an open bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just see better. Yeah, I think you don't on an aircraft carrier. I think an aircraft carrier is all—it's a bit more kind of yeah 
But you know, you say you suddenly think to yourself, okay, well, I'm trying to kind of describe what this guy would have to do. I don't really know anything about it, and you know, what happens on a destroyer? How does it work? How does it operate? How many how many people are on a on a destroyer crew on a, a tribal yeah. class? And you know, what's the what's the makeup and and it's fascinating. And and what's yeah. what's what's it's, it's so completely obvious. Of course, this is the case. But when you realise the incredibly intricate laws and ways of doing things and traditions and courtesies and things which are expected as a young rnvr royal navy volunteer reserve yeah. there's a heck of a lot that you've got to remember and it must seem this incredibly bewildering world when you first join your your ship i mean you've come from yep. hms alfred or whatever yeah which is a sort of training depot for, for new officers and you know, you've been trained and you've been trained pretty well, but 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 it's a completely different kettle of fish because you're trained for all sorts when you're at Alfred, and suddenly you're allocated to a battleship or a submarine or whatever it might be, and you have to do further training. But if you go to a destroyer or a corvette or a frigate or something, you're absolutely just flung in at the at the deep end, and you kind of you know you've got your little booklet on things that you should do and things that you get. But, but God, it must be so easy to forget. The thing I was really struck by and that you've got to bear in mind is this is a 24-hour environment, isn't it? Yes. Because the compliment, say, of um, HMS Athabascan, which is one of the, which is a, can- a Canadian uh, uh, destroyer, is yeah. 10, 10 seamen specialist officers, including a captain. So you've got your, basically the, 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 the people in charge of the ship, yeah. two engineer officers, one paymaster, one medical officer, one gun officer, 110 seamen. And that's because everything's on shift. It's a 24-hour operation. So so what if you whatever you've got, you need at least two of him because at some point he has to he has to get some sleep. 30 stokers, 15 engine artificers and mechanics, nine telegraphists, nine signalmen, three coders, four cooks, four stewards. You in those numbers, you can see the sort of 24-hour. Um, yes, you can. Uh, requirement, can't you? 50 other men from specialist branches. So it's about 259, I think I totted it up. Yeah, the kind of noted establishment is between 190 and 219 on a British tribal and slightly more on a Canadian. On a Canadian, the Canadian ship. But that's the thing I was really struck by is that how this is a 24-hour a thing, which takes you, you know, then takes you on to how they run watches, which is the sort of the absolute key to how these naval ships are run. There's also this this absolute hierarchy where, where everyone knows exactly where everyone sits you know captain is god basically he is in charge it doesn't matter what rank he is whether he's lieutenant commander commander or actually a captain he is the captain of that ship and so there's little things you should do so every time you see him for the first time of the day you should say good morning sir and salute him and thereafter you don't need to say that and you don't need to salute him again <laughs> but first time you do yeah it's all very it's subtle isn't brilliant. it and, yeah. and the fact that the cap, but well, the little detail I found, which I thought was absolutely fascinating, is that the caps are round. Mm. So obviously your your head is oval rather than round. Yeah. But they are round and they're deliberately round. And so people, you want you want to kind of sort of move them slightly to one side or to the back of your head so they fit a little bit better. Yeah. But that's really frowned on. It's fine if you're if you're able because I remember. Do you remember that picture of um, Bertie Packer? Yes. That I had. He was the captain of, yeah. of HMS Warspite, the battleship. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there he is with his cap on his on the back of his head and another one yeah. slightly on his side. That's fine because he's an admiral. He can do what he likes. Yeah. But when you're a, when you're a sub-lieutenant in the RNVR, you absolutely can't. You have to wear it. And it it, it it presses down on your temples and it's really uncomfortable. But the the people that commissioned this hat, were they thinking, right, what this will offer is way of, ways of ranks expressing themselves. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> further down the line. Maybe, but it's just, it, it's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, it's really, really, really And also, really you're, you're constantly surrounded by who, you know, reminded who you are. So a regular naval person, the stripes are straight. Yeah. You know, around, around, the, around, the, uh, around the bottom of the sleeves. Yeah. Whereas if you're Royal Navy Reserve, they're kind of interwoven braiding with a little kind of dot. Yeah. yeah. And then if you're RMVR, they're kind of wiggly braiding. Yeah. So everyone knows from a glance whether you are... A pr- well, essentially, a, professional, a pro, a pro, or a pro or, or a temporary or a gentleman, yeah. But you don't have that in the army. Oh, they all know perfectly well, though. <laughs> let's, let's, yes, let's but not... you have sort of TD, don't you? After your after yeah. your your initials, if you're a territorial, but 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 you know, in the middle of battle, you don't wear it. Yeah, but, yeah, but at yeah. all times, everyone knows who everyone is. Yeah, in the navy. Yeah, but th- but this is this is because the ship has to operate 
completely efficiently, doesn't it? Like a machine. Completely efficiently. I mean, there are literally no passengers. That's the that's the thing for all the hundreds of people yeah, yeah, on yeah. board. There are no passengers because I, I, the, the, it's the watch keeping thing that I think is. I think that's it's the watch that's central to how these ships work, though. Yes. So you've you've got. The four-hour watches and then dog watches, which are two hours long. But they're always between 4 and 8 p.m. Yeah. And that's to vary the system. Well, exactly. That's the thing that kind of puts the leap year into the day, doesn't it? That moves it yes. all along one. Yeah. Look, make sure make sure no day is exact. The days aren't exactly the same. Yeah. You're always moving along and you're mo- always moving along the watches. But I think the thing you, the thing that was most striking in, in what you sent me was the officer of the watch is responsible for the safety of the ship. He is not relieved of the responsibility by the presence on the bridge of a senior officer. That is really interesting, isn't it? Because yep. that's how you make a thing run by clockwork because the responsibility in that situation is devolved. There may well be a captain on deck, but the officer of the watch is in charge. It's his responsibility and he's, got, he's just got a man up. When you read it in black and white, that is, that, that's quite a thing. You're 21, you're straight out of, of training. And you're the officer of the watch. And obviously you have to qualify. You have to get your watch keeper certificate. But the fact is you're, you know, an admiral comes on deck, but you're but you're the person who's got the responsibility. I mean, that's that's extraordinary, isn't it? Yes, but you're also you're also doing that before you've got your watch keeping certificate. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And there's again, there's a whole load of hierarchy on that as well. Yeah. It's just fascinating. So generally speaking, the first lieutenant or the number one, he might be excused watches, but generally would be expected to do one but maybe one a day rather than two watches per day. And in between, you're expected to do other roles. So it's not just about watchkeeping. It's also about learning about seamanship. Yeah. You would get trained up on specific areas, although navigation and gunnery required specialist skills and engineers yeah. obviously required specialist skills, but you would be encouraged to kind of get across up on them. The yeah. And you would also have all the kind of sort of complications that you do with bookkeepers, endless bookkeeping on a ship. You know, from the amount you drink to stores to incoming, you know, being in charge of post and mail, of of, of overseeing signals, of, of you know, just so much stuff. It's just it's 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 absolutely ex- extraordinary. The thing about the watch keeping certificate, which you really need, that allows you to progress up the ranks and become a first lieutenant rather than a sub lieutenant. But you have to be over twenty five, or in exceptional circumstances, over twenty two, with yeah. a minimum of one year's service and the recommendation by the your commanding officer. And a younger officer would need two and a half years service. But interestingly, if you're over 30, you only need three months. Oh, yeah, that's a bit... Well, that, so the principle is is that because you're older, you're more worldly, you're, you're more, better, you're more, at, you're better at looking after a younger crew. You're more responsible. I would say that kind of more or less follows. Well, and, maybe, and, the, and the, men, the men are according you that too, aren't they? Yes, which when you think that the, um, the, the, the Duke of Edinburgh was the youngest, uh, as he was, um, was the youngest first lieutenant in the Royal Navy in 1943. That does make him exceptional. That is unusual, yeah. And the challenges, of course, is is that you know, as a you know, you're a young twenty two R and VR officer, and you're the watch, you know, you're the uh, officer on watch, and your big decision is at what point do you contact the captain? Yeah, when do you wake him up? Basically, it's really interesting when you look at the movies. <laughs> all you ever see is the captain on the bridge, yeah. but actually, the captain isn't on the bridge very often. And of course, the reason you would see the the, the captain in a movie is because he's on the bridge when something's happening. Yeah. So it's obviously, if you're in the middle of a of a sort of hunting down a, a U-boat or you're launching an attack, then the captain's on the bridge. But for the vast majority of time, neither of those things are happening. You're just yeah. trundling through the Mediterranean, trundling across the Atlantic or whatever. And so you shouldn't really be calling the, the captain. The captain's got other things to worry about and think about. But that's the decision. You know, At what point do you go, no, I can handle this myself? Or do you think, oh, really, I should just sort of check with the, with the boss here? It's quite a fine line to walk, I would suggest, on a number of occasions. Well, I mean, when we read that Ark Royal thing, the captain wasn't at the, on the bridge when the ship was struck by a torpedo. Yep. He was elsewhere because he you know, had stuff to do. That, yep. I think that makes the point. They're, they're in the middle of a, an enc- a U-boat encounter. There's a scare on, but he's not He's not on the bridge. He's got other stuff to do. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, say, say you're officer on watch and it's nighttime, it's in the Atlantic and you're rolling terribly. You've got to have the crew on hand to kind of sort of lash down. Yeah. And down the hatches, literally. Yeah. You've also got to know intimately the rule of the road because you you know you might have an alert. You might need to do some zigzagging, but you don't want to crash into a into the convoy. Yeah, you've got to be absolutely aware of your position the whole time. Pretty yeah. complex navigation. You have to be completely aware of. It's a hell of a lot to think about. You know, you're big figures. The times where you're just sort of in a dead calm, kind of trundling through the Mediterranean, or, or kind of you know it's a summer in the high summer across the Atlantic in the middle of the day. 
for every time you have that kind of 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 moment, you've got these more challenging moments of storms and night time and lack of visibility and all the rest of it. I'll tell you what, we'll take, let's take a quick break and we'll come back to this because there's there's also the vittling we need to talk about. Yes. <laughs> we'll see you in a second. Welcome back to Way of Ways to Make You Talk. Um, we're just going through the lo- life on a destroyer. What technology are we? We're looking at ASDIC. We took, mentioned the hydrophone earlier. Yeah, well, we should. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely get onto radar and ASDIC and all that kind of stuff. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll 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 talk about that in a minute. But but yeah. we should also talk about the roles of the of the officers as well. So you yeah. obviously navigation is a key part of it. We we're just hinting at a minute ago. But you also have this thing called divisions, which I think is really really interesting, where the ship's crews divided up into different divisions. So you have seamen, stokers, yeah. communications, all the rest of it, and one officer is put in charge of each of that particular group known as the divisions. Yeah. And it's his responsibility to do the kind of, you know, the pastoral care bit. You know, so if there's a problem, he's got to sort it out. And 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 the crew would go to him with that problem. It might be a quarrel, it might be yeah. trouble at home, it might be yeah. drunk and stuff. It could be it could be anything. And a captain might call all divisions. You know, that's when you're kind of lining all up on the deck and everyone's out there and he's doing a pep talk about, right, we're all off to Dunkirk or, you know, we've now got a major operation. We're going to do Operation Pedestal. This is really important. Yeah. You know, blah, blah, blah. So that would be all divisions. But yeah, you were talking about, about vittling. Well, yes. It's just incredible. Well, because, I mean, I loved Hornblower books when I was a kid. So you, you yes. mentioned C.S. Forrest early on. And there's there's all the stuff in there about how in the Napoleonic era, a, a captain would literally be running the ship as a, uh, essentially as a business. He'd be given the money by the by the Royal Navy to run the ship, so he'd then buy the victuals and the supplies. So being a captain and the victualing, they're completely tangled. You know, the, the officers and the victualing are totally tangled up with each other. Obviously, it isn't the case, but that that in the 1940s, captains are you know given a million quid and told to run a destroyer, but in effect, that's what they're doing, and. Obviously, the Navy's famous for the rum issue, but there's everything. There's absolutely everything else. Yes. There's the mess book, the quarterly provision accounts, abstract of soap and tissue, the spirit issue, spirit stoppage book. Yes. We've talked before about how the, the REF is like a, a mountain of paperwork. And, you know, for every aircraft, you know exactly who's got on it and and then who, who comes back. But consider how many people there are on ships. The, 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 yeah. the sheer paperwork, the sheer churn of notebooks and the survey note the gangway wine and spirit book the short leave book the registered letter book all of these have to be kept up yeah and it would be one of the those officers in between is you know when you're on watch you're on watch yeah but the rest of the time you're getting your head down and you're doing these other chores such as yeah. keeping the book doing the bookkeeping and learning about seamanship and and, uh, yeah. and all the rest of it yeah. but the other thing i thought was really funny is is that most of them most of the ships have a ship's fund yeah and which, which money is raised from tom bowlers which which in the new money is called bingo it's incredible isn't it yeah here's fun let's have a bingo we'll raise some money so we can all get pissed i mean that's basically it i suppose yeah but i suppose what can you do? The, 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 this is this is, be- so. this is before DVDs, isn't it? Basically, <laughs> yeah. And there's sort of nice descriptions of the, of, the, of the wardroom, you know, where where the officers would be, where you'd have sort of fold away tables and stuff, but you'd also have shelves on the wall full of books because you know it was quite a lot of time to read. Yeah. So there'd be all these sort of battered old paperbacks, which would sort of do the rounds, a little radio stuff like that. So a few sort of home comforts. Yeah. And also, the, the the whole discipline thing, I think, is really, really interesting. Well, yes, that's what I was going to say, because you're all living on top of each other. So that must actually be quite... That must require subtlety, actually, in how you deal with it. Being a martinet. After all, martinet isn't... That's a term of that's a term of abuse, isn't it? That you've, you've got quite a line to walk, haven't you? C- keeping discipline yeah. um, on a ship. And again, especially because this is a 24-hour rotating, ever-permanent... You know, you keep one watch happy, but you've got to keep the others happy too you know this this yeah constant sort of turn of the thing and what do you do with the drunken sailor that's the well it's, it's it's absolutely brilliant this isn't it so 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 basically the, Na- the navy's very clear on this you're either drunk or you're not drunk but there's no gray area whatsoever yeah is the man fit in all respects to carry on his duty if the opinion of the oow the officer of the watch is no and provided the man's condition is due to the intox- intoxicating effect effective liquor then the man is drunk. If yes, then he is sober. Note, there is no such thing in naval law as having drink taken. The man is either drunk or sober. 
<laughs> Isn't it brilliant? I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, it's absolutely brilliant. Re- really, really, really funny. And you know, all these other areas, of, of course, are you know, we are focusing on officers here. It has to be said. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. but, but, the other area, of course, is is when they're in action, and you know, he is expected to set an example of coolness, imperturbability, resolve, and show his technical and tactical skill at the same time. Yeah. You know, which is why you have all this. I mean, you know, that is absolutely culturally embedded at every stage of of the armed forces, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and that, yeah. that's why when you when you listen to those recordings of people on bomber command missions, how are we doing, navigator? Yeah, so carry all on. that kind of stuff. It's, it's, you know, but that that that's very much a part of it. And, and I've got to say, I find that all that I, I can see why that would be a jolly good thing. You don't want people kind of shouting and getting hysterical. You want no. unfrappability. You want coolness, don't you? Yep. You need to be clear. Very well. I see it's all that. All that stuff. The thing is, though, if you have a culture of keeping cool, then you keep cool, don't you? You just do. If it's encouraged, if that's the if that's the style, then you you're you're, you're going to end up doing it yourself, aren't you? I suppose. Yes, and, and inside you might be thinking, "Holy crap!" Yeah. But outwardly, you sort of go, "We've spotted a U-boat. We're chasing it now." <laughs> yeah. Death charges away. <laughs> It's just, it's a, but the world is better like that, I think. Well, maybe. You don't want everyone being well proud of each other and kind of sort of hugging each other left, right, and centre and kind of being emotional. You, no. You want cool and imperturbability. Yeah, you don't want high-fiving, do you? Sink, you sink a U-boat. Uh, obviously, th- th- there's also, if you're high-fiving each other, there's, where's the pity in war, as it were? Yes. I mean, th- well done, man. That. Carry on. <laughs> Very well. That's what you want. <laughs> so they have all the, they, they, they do have the, obviously, gunnery is a big part on tribals. Um, and they do have this sort of gun control tower, the director gun director control tower, uh, which is an amazing piece of kit. Um, yeah. And of course, you know, thanks to the cavity magnetron, they do have from 1940 or 41 onwards. Most of them have have radar, which is the Type 271 is the most common. And this is a this is a shape a bit like a segment of a circle and a similar receiver. And this is this is inside a kind of cage like structure, which is usually fitted just behind the bridge. Um, and obviously, the operator of this has to stay close to the aerial and, and, and work inside this little sort of cage structure where it's yeah. where it's located. Um, but what I think is quite interesting is the aerial on the two seven one had to be turned by hand to the direction reverse. So it, it does it goes all the way around three hundred and sixty yeah. degrees, but it can't yeah. do it again. He's then got to go back the other way. So it's going, you know, it's, it's sweeping one way, but it sweeps the other way three hundred and sixty degrees. This is very interesting, though, isn't it, Jim? Because the year before nineteen forty. Radar um, or RDF in the Battle of Britain is these peculiar things on pylons, yeah. and is very often presented in the in the sort of not the historiography, but the sort of received account as you know this sort of Heath Robinson radar yes. that we've only just managed to scrape together, and the Germans don't know, so that's all yeah, right, yes, and all yes, this yes, sort yes. of thing. Whereas, if, what that's telling you is that the Admiralty are well ahead on this; they've got the money and they've spent the money, haven't they? Mm-hmm. Um, because if a thing's in, if a thing's fitted in 1941, that means it's well in production in 1940, which means it's signed off in 1939. Because I often think the RDF in the Battle of Britain is presented as, as this kind of muddled through thing that looks like, looks like like it's made of coat hangers and, and plucky old blighty coming up with a Meccano solution to a to, you know to a high tech yep. problem. And the German the Germans have got radar that spins around. You They've know, got like Wurzburg and Freya exactly and all that. Whereas in actual fact, a decision has been made that what we're going to need is to prioritise radar um, uh, technology for the Battle of the Atlantic because that's your most important battlefield. And also the the, the RDF home chain works, so you don't need to snazz it up and shrink it and all that sort of thing works perfectly well it's got stacks of redundancy built into it so you're fine and rather than it being this sort of heath robinson thing it's actually entirely the right bit of kit for the moment thanks very much yeah and i'm really struck by that that that, you know destroyers by 1941 got a cavity magnetron radar that that then essentially gets updated but the core thing of it the cavity magnetron doesn't need to change because they've done the work yeah well i mean there's, there's no question that the priority for r&d research and development in britain is to is to win the battle of the atlantic as quickly as possible yeah what that means is that by you know, by 1941, their destroyers are plying their trade across the Atlantic and escorting yeah. all these convoys. Are really you know, pretty sophisticated pieces of kit, but yeah. also they're pretty sophisticated pieces of kit that can operate, you know, off Norway or in the Channel or uh, in the Mediterranean yeah. or wherever. So, you know, they're, they're they're pretty good. I mean, they've got they've got the radar, they've got they've got Huff Duff, 
yep. you know, high frequency direction fighting, which you have in the RAF as well. You know, it's all part of the Battle Britain Air Defence yeah. Network. Yeah. But 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 and, and and this is this is this is radio rather than radar. I mean, radar is a sort of form of radio because is yeah. is is radio direction. But you have to have two separate readings. It would take from two different ships to get a sort of cross bearing, but that's how you that's how you do it. But most yeah. most escort groups are able to do this by late nineteen forty two. And again, what you need is you need experience. It's a bit like sort of reading reading signals from radar when you're in the Battle of Britain. The more more you do it, the more experience you become at it, the better you are at recognizing it. Because you know it doesn't sort of say a formation of forty Dorniers coming across the channel. It just says a, a load of guff on my cathode ray screen. And experience teaches you how to read it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's exactly the same on a ship. The more the more you do it, the better you become at it um and it's the same with readings of huff duff and again a bit like the battle of britain it's more powerful when it's a sort of collective sum of individual parts you know it's it's an observer core it's a filter room creating a cross-reference essentially you, you create a cross-reference so it's, it's it's radar and huff duff and asdic and asdic is really interesting it's what we now call sonar we talk a lot about it don't we and asdic toad and all the rest of it yeah 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 but asdic is that thing that you have on u boats that you have on ships where you know the pings and and it's kind of has a little sort of wiggle across the screen and all the rest of it but it's obviously a really really key part of being on a destroyer yeah and a really key part of the royal navy and they've got a whole yeah. school for this so you know it's, yeah. it's um, uh, opera, um, hms osprey which was in portland and and then gets moved to the river clyde to a sort of hotel and, and and it's one of the few naval bases that has carpet in the uh, in the building on the over, overlooking the river Clyde, but you, you know you would get trained up as a, as an SD, a submarine detector, or as right. an ASCO, which is an anti submarine control officer. And as the anti submarine control officer, you would be overall in charge of the ASDIC. But amazingly, it's a, you know if you're RVR, you go along that. It'd be it's a twelve day course. Bloody hell! A lot's taken. Very intense. And then back to your ship. Yeah, but Aztec is actually developed at the end of the First World War. But this is the other thing: is that is that is that this is this is a piece of technology that's been kicking around for a while, hasn't it? And yeah, I think what's really interesting about this, and it's it's not to be honest, it's not unlike Bomber Command in terms that there are some very long lead decisions. Yeah, about how the campaign's going to be fought long term. You know, those bomber specifications that come out in thirty seven, thirty eight, and there's there's a similar there's a similar appreciation. Um, so the Shipping Defence Advisory Committee, they say in 1937, the submarine menace will never be what it was before. So they're, they're saying, actually, we've got a thing ready or on its way that will that will help, which I think is very, very, I mean, that's very bullish language two years before the yeah, war yeah. to be using. It, w- it will never be a fatal menace again like it was in the last war. I mean, that's very punchy, isn't it, as a, as a yes. way of looking at the forthcoming problems. But despite that, I mean, that sounds incredibly complacent, doesn't it? But actually, they're not complacent because they are doing developing radar and they are developing all this stuff. And once the war begins, and signed u boats are still sinking things. Yes, rather than being complacent, it's them going, oh, we actually, we've got this, we've got this under control. Don't, you know... Just you wait and see, isn't it? Yes, yes, but Aztec on its own doesn't work. That's the yeah, point. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah, yeah, it doesn't, yeah. doesn't solve the menace. No. So, so although that statement is quite complacent, in actual fact, they're not being complacent because they are developing stuff all the time. Mm. Yeah. You know, the capability of hunting down a, a U-boat at the beginning of the war compared to the end of the war is streets head by 1945, obviously. Yeah. But Aztec is fascinating because, you know, the, the, the big problem is that radio is ineffective in water, but a sound wave can be detected accurately and, and that's the key to it so you have a you have a little sort of transporter which is mounted under the forward hull of the ship so it sort of sticks down right at it's right at the front of the boat it's kind of what's called known as the Aztec dome but it's not it's not yeah. really a dome it's like a little sort of nodule that sort of hangs yeah. off the of the bow of the boat right at the front of the water and, and that casts this beam out in front of it but but only on a kind of certain certain bandwidth as well there's only so much it can do yes it can go down a bit but but basically, it's, it's a kind of arc that goes certain degrees width and certain degrees down. And so the, the key is when you're when you're getting the echo back, do you identify it correctly? And you know, is it a shoal of fish or a whale or something, or is yeah. it actually a a U boat? And once you and w- w- then you also need to work out what kind of you know, obviously, the U boat isn't standing still either. Mm. So you've got to be able to sort of judge the width of it and what direction bearing it's going. And you can do that by kind of twiddling around and taking the different readings. But you know, it's quite a skilled thing. Yes, that takes a lot of practice, and you haven't. Got, I mean, how much time you've got for trial and error is the is the question? Because error, error, after all, it could be could be fatal, couldn't it? That's the thing. So yeah, uh, yeah. Um, is the Aztec on all the time, 
or do you turn it on in moments of emergency or of of sighting? No, it it, it is on most of the time. But it, you know, if you're going fast, obviously, if you're going at thirty six knots, you don't really want your Aztec dome so it can retract up into the into the bow. So obviously, it wouldn't be on then. But obviously, on a sweep and stuff, when you're when you're doing a sort of transatlantic convoy, you would have it on all the time, I guess. And what about other people's ASDIC? Can is there, is there an issue that if you're close to someone else, you can hear their pings, or is, or is it? No, no, you can only hear your own pings. But you know, you wouldn't, and also you wouldn't be that close to another destroyer. That no, you're... no. But noise pollution is obviously an issue when you're listening for things, isn't it? So, yeah. So, yeah. So as but as we heard earlier with the Art Royal, they with the hydrophone, they hear the torpedoes propellers. They think it's something else. I mean, the, yes. The, the, like I say, the, the margin for error, the trial and error is the error is fatal, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and this is and and the and the and the, and the, the ASCO and the SD, the submarine detector and the um, anti-submarine uh, anti-shipping anti-submarine control officer they have to decide whether the echo is a submarine or a, a possible submarine or not a submarine and obviously you know stakes are possibly high on this and at night or in poor visibility the Aztec operator you know might go over to the hydrophone effect whereby he's no longer transmitting but instead listening to the noise of the u-boat's props engine and movements and you know you might hear different types of noises so so a whistle for example a, a, a one or two second little sort of whistle that's usually fish mm. but a much longer one would be more likely to be a submarine and a, and a sub sounds much more like a sort of creaking hinge yeah god you know under the water or is that a whale communicating i mean you know well yeah yeah absolutely it is very very difficult obviously uh, uh, whenever we whenever we look at any of the any of the what it's like at the sharp ends i come away thinking well i don't like the sound of that but I don't like the sound of a lot of this. No, <laughs> no. Seems awfully like I mean, hard I don't know. work. I, I, I mean, I always used to think, well, you know, being on a destroyer would be the best job, really, because you know you get to see lots of action, you do lots of different things. You know, you feel like a like you've done your bit, but chances of getting hit are probably you know quite small, really. Yeah. But then you realise that kind of half the destroyers in the war got got sunk. Yeah. And then you're, you know, I mean, I, th- I thought what was amazing about the the, the the Art Royal is only one crewman was killed. You know, fifteen hundred people on an, on yeah. an aircraft carrier or something. That that's that those that that's quite good odds in that instance. But you just don't know, do you? This is the, this. I think always the thing with when ships go down is that sometimes it's no, you know, three people survive out of a, a ship's complement of sort of fifteen hundred people, or plenty of them do, and it just seems yeah. to be a complete crapshoot, doesn't it? If you're if you are hit, if you are in trouble there's just no way of knowing is there well yeah i mean i've i've, I've been reading there's there was a book the only tribal class that still survives is um hmcs a majesty's right. canadian is his majesty's canadian ship hyder uh which is in in is now museum ship in in ontario and there was a book written about it about the hyder which was just launched in 1943 and was still going at the end of the war uh, and a book was written just after the war drawing on all the kind of guys experiences and stuff yeah and obviously, when Hyder kind of goes to commission, a lot of the crew have been on other ships. Yeah. So the new guys are sitting, oh, tell us some stories, tell us some yards. And all of them are kind of, you know, been sunk at some point. Mm. And uh, there's a lovely there's a lovely line so it says, many of the men could have told similar stories, but the survivors seldom talked about their experiences unless it was to recall some humorous incident, like the time one of the officers now on board had been torpedoed in a corvette. He was in his bunk, related the coxswain, in pyjamas, the only man in the ship with his clothes off. He woke up when the torpedo came in and jumped for the ladder. She was going down fast. He didn't wait for a life jacket or anything else. Seeing a raft about 100 yards off, he dived for the tide and swam to it. He must have beat the record he was going so fast. He climbs aboard and looks around. Hello, boys, he says. It's kind of cold here. And with that, he starts to button up his wet pyjamas. <laughs> Isn't that great? And it's amazing how many people seem to have stories of being on a raft or being in a lifeboat or it's a bit like being in the tank at some point, you know, the chance your ship will get hit. Yeah. And you've just got to kind of suck it up, you know, yeah. and, and, and a bit like a tank, you know, whether you die or get incinerated or get out of it alive, yeah. it's kind of in the lap of the gods. But if you are, you know, if you are in the water, you might be covered in oil. Yes. And obviously th- that means Climbing onto a raft might be very, very difficult because you're stuck yeah. with oil and, and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And it might be covered in oil too. And the cold, you end up going back to the going back to the cruel sea, really. 
and those images of men in the water. I mean, it's terrifying. The whole thing's absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm going off it now, Jim. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's a very nice, uh, well, we should probably end with this. This is a very nice quote from Ludovic Kennedy, who some people might remember. Um, and, and he wrote a book called Sub Lieutenant, which I think he published in 1941, 42 or something. But it's about sort of early days. So it's Norway and you know, early convoys and all that kind of stuff. And at one point after after the Norway campaign, he's, they're, they're based up at Scapa up in Scotland. So they're doing kind of short patrol work, really. And he says, sometimes he went to sea for two or three days anti-submarine patrol. It was fun if the weather was fine. I remember some happy middle watches on the bridge where the sea was calm and night bright with stars. Leading on the front of the bridge, drinking cups of cocoa the messenger brought up from time to time. I used to discuss many subjects with my fellow officer of the watch. Sex, religion, the navy, literature, art and the human emotions. One got to know one's messmates best that way. But there were other watches when the bows plunged furiously into the hard sea, throwing sheets of spray over the bridge. The cocoa was late and lukewarm. The captain was in a bad temper. One started the zigzag the wrong way and threw everyone else out. Those watches were not so pleasant. And then, of course, there's the cruel sea. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, very amazingly evocative. Well, thanks, Jim, because, you know, we don't do enough Navy. We're we don't do enough do, Navy. We're going to have to do a frigate next. Yeah, or a cruiser or something. But, but we've also we've got to do the Battle of the North Cape as well. Yeah, we do, yeah. With lots to do. There's always more. There's, There's always, always more. more. But more always Navy, more. I think, generally. Yeah, more Navy. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening. Don't forget, uh, July the 19th to the 21st, um, uh, we have Ways Fest. We have WaysFest.co.uk, and we promise more Navy uh, uh, at that festival, don't we, Jim? There will also be the occasional Wrong War talk at uh, We Have Ways Fest next year, where people will talk about... Um, I don't know, Waterloo or something like that. A little bit, not too much, just a little bit. Just a little bit, just a little bit, because some of it's interesting. Anyway, we'll see you all very soon. Thanks for listening. Cheerio. Cheerio. Cheerio.